So a lot of people are losing their history. My grandmother has passed on, so the history needs to continue to go. They need to be able to share my stories. This is the mom, which is um, where my Cherokee comes from. Her mom is uh, half Cherokee, her grandfather. Great, my great grandfather is full blood Cherokee. This is on one of my grandmother's visits to Seattle when I was a little girl. This is my grandmother here, my mom. And our travels down south, standing in front of the car. I think this is in front of my grandmother's. And the other person in the picture is my sister. <laughs> my grandmother, I never heard her talk about being Indian. As much as, um, you know, I don't really recall them talking about our heritage as much until she passed away. Our family is really spread out from New Orleans to what they call the country. <laughs> Hoping to take a trip this summer, get more information about you know, the family and the lineage and everything. The best advice I received from an elder when I struggled with being mixed race was to be asked, so which one of your grandmothers then is unworthy of you recognizing her. And that really struck home for me. That there is no grandmother that you can look at no matter what color you are, no matter what background you come from. There isn't a time where you can look at one of your grandmothers and say, eh, her Irish heritage is unworthy of me. Or her black heritage is unworthy of me. Um, I define myself as a Muscogee Creek woman of African American and Irish Scott descent. I was adopted transracially and my parents were white and I also had a Korean daughter and a white son. For me, my personal experience, I felt very um, cocooned by the urban native community. There seemed to be a responsibility by those um, natives that were um, my parents' age to ensure that I was part of the community because I had been adopted out. I think what's weird for me is that I'm not considered um, African American enough for people to watch what they say around me in Indian country so the n-word is used in front of me because the reasoning is what do you care? It shouldn't bother you at all. Look at you. And it does bother me. But for the most part I would find that in the urban Indian communities, it's it's really not about um, anti-African American sentiment. It's pro-Native sentiment. Are you Native or not? They don't care whether you're mixed with Black or not. Are you Native or not? The children, I think sometimes they think I'm too hard-lined or too traditional. And then in other ways, they're even more traditional. Um, you know, when my daughter, when my older daughter got her hair cut, she was just mortified that they had to cut her hair. And she was very concerned about making sure that the hair was um, properly um, taken care of by somebody in our community. And yet she had to endure the um, misunderstandings that go with going into a black hair salon and saying I need you to keep all this hair and I need you to put it in a bag and don't you know touch it and don't you know mix it with other hair and having the people that are there wanna you know be interested y'all doing some voodoo stuff in there y'all doing you know what are you gonna do and and that kind of um, realization that you know you're looking across the table at a, at a black person talking to you and usually as a black Indian you're thinking well now I can tell you're a black Indian but you know nothing about your heritage and this moment right here in the hair salon is a moment that's a cultural difference. 
and um, my mother being an Irish Scott Creek, um, my father being a Black Creek. There was when you start to see yourself um, with pride attached to it, it then allows you to start to realize, you know, if I don't have the pride now, my daughters and my son won't have the pride later. If I don't maintain it, I will be that black girl's grandmother on the wall that she walks past and says, see my Indian grandmother with her long hair and her cheekbones? I was, you know, I don't know what tribe, I don't know her name, but I know she's Indian. That's my biggest fear. I don't want my kids to have so little interest in who I am and who they are and who their grandmothers were that I become that picture on that wall. Stop thinking of us as the joke, she's got good hair, she must have Indian in her. You know, stop thinking of us as the unique person at Pow Wow. Because in Indian country, we're not unique. Everybody that's, that's native, that's grown up native, will tell you that they either have a relative who's black, or you know, that they grew up on the res with a black Indian that didn't speak a word of English or whatever. Our experience is unique and we've been here longer than a lot of people and as long as most people and we have the right to be um, recognized as a unique and individual group of ethnic people. If you want to know who you are as an Indian person, then you have to start and that is by understanding what Indian people are going through now and today. If you don't understand the Native community, but you are of Native descent, that doesn't necessarily mean that you um, can't be part of the Native community, but you have to be willing to put in the work. I know who I am, and society is so um, judgmental based on how we look. So, um, everybody else sees me, I'm sure, you know, as a black woman, I think, you know. <laughs> Some of the things that I've learned in the Native classes that I've taken um, and in my research and doing some reading and how it kind of upset me to find out that Native people aren't very accepting of Africans and even within the African community and within the Native community, we have our own prejudices and our own um, animosities towards each other. I didn't even realize that the same thing that happens in the African American uh, community happens in the Native community of light skin, dark skin. You know, people thinking they're better than others and I'm like, well, why would I want to identify with people that don't even want me, you know, or want to identify or allow me to identify with them. And so that was sort of the thing that I'm now battling with before. I was like, oh yeah, you know, I'm going to say this and then I'm this. Now it's like, well, that's not how I'm viewed or perceived or accepted, which even being a, a black woman being accepted in society is, you know, difficult. I'm not going to shun who I am, but I might start checking other on my applications, you know, <laughs> you know, I don't know. This is something I'm kind of working through still. Oral tradition among the Mohegan Pequot, because Mohegan and Pequot are, they originally were one people in uh, the same language and traditions and everything. The Mohegan Pequot came into this area of southern New England around the turn of the century from 1500 to 1600 and um, they hadn't been here that long in the area before the pilgrims landed in 1620. They stole the land from the native people that were here but they stole the man to work it so the only way the land of opportunity could ever take place would be to bring in a stock of slaves because they could never work the land to uh, produce all that it was capable of without that taking place. What happened after they brought in the African slaves in such large numbers, more and more intermarriage took place as there was less and less of a distinctly Indian presence and you had more and more of uh, the mixtures or mulattoes as it shows in the census records. Mulatto, I hate that term because it's just an umbrella to sweep all Indian people under. And then there was an, after that term came about, then they, they came up with the term um, colored 
and that was another big umbrella to sweep all the Indian people on. Anything so they wouldn't have to put the word Indian in the record books. So what they couldn't accomplish with the torch and the gun, they hoped to accomplish with the stroke of a pen. And it's for that reason I reject totally the label of black Indian because I've seen people use that term. I've seen some of our own people use it themselves, but usually it's an externally applied term. And uh, I reject that totally as long as there are blonde-headed Mohawks and blue-eyed Cherokees who are not identified as Euro-Indians, why should any Indian that has any black ancestry be identified as a black Indian? What's good for the goose has to be good for the gander, but it's just a reflection of the racism that's in this society in general. When this whole idea of <coughs> recognition, federal recognition, uh, uh, started to manifest itself, the government was basically holding up a hoop that we all had to jump through as tribes. And so, if you couldn't make it through, or if you're almost making it through, and they decided to raise it higher, you had to jump higher and do even more tricks. So it ends up with a process where mountains and mountains of detailed documentation has to be put together to submit to the very same people who have spent all of their time here on your land trying to stop your existence. That's essentially what the uh, uh, recognition process is. In a nutshell. What a lot of our people do here when, when people come and they, they want to put us down because we have mixed blood and they don't like the way the mixture is, that instead of putting us down, we need to be given a lot of credit. The fact that we still have been able to remain Indian after over 300 years of every attempt in, on heaven's earth to destroy us as Indian people. I think we have a great deal of right to be proud in, in our sense of Indianness that we still retain because uh, the easiest thing in the world is to be absorbed, you know. It doesn't take any strength at all to do that because you've got forces on either side that's waiting to just absorb you. But to remain Indian, that's the hardest thing. And, uh, but survival is a beautiful thing. I felt kind of um, a little uncomfortable, kind of like I wasn't really welcome, but um, kind of walking through a little bit and feeling pulled, you know, like I want to participate and want to be a part of it, but can't. There was an older woman that walked in that um, I was looking at. As soon as she walked in, I thought of my grandmother, and I think a lot of the older women, um, their, um, their features remind me of my grandmother. and make me realize how much um, native blood she had in her and I didn't really realize it but I see a lot of it more in the older women. Once I felt more comfortable knowing more about my history um, and probably connecting more with my native culture and some people in the community I'd feel a little bit more like I would belong but I think that would help. Oh, 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 hey. I think I've become very comfortable with myself because of my family and I would probably give all the credit to my grandmother. She always worked hard to make sure that kids were happy. She always gave everything to make kids feel empowered. So when I think about how much she gave and how much time she spent in teaching kids beading and culture and cooking. I mean, I'd credit a lot of that to her. Well, I was born and raised my whole life on the Makah Indian Reservation in Nia Bay. You know, there I can't think of um, a better place to raise your children in terms of having your family there. I mean, just living in the city and you see so many people suffer and do without. Just growing up in Nia Bay, we're all such a tight-knit community that there was always food on the table, people are always warm, and um, everybody opened their houses up to each other. So it's just a very loving, very giving, very friendly community. Just a lot of people that would give, you know, their last dime to you if you ever need anything. And 
lived with my mother and my two sisters, Justine and Helena, and my father, Ernest Grimes. So pretty much grew up knowing that I was from the Parker family. Nobody ever really shined light on the fact that I was also African American and Irish because everybody in Nia Bay was basically Macaw and the school was 99.9% .9 Macaw. We were Macaw so the only difference was is we had curly hair and everybody else had long hairs and then when I went away to college I found myself more so gravitating towards African American people because that's how everybody off the reservation viewed me. Nobody had no clue I was born and raised on the reservation and I had a a lot of girlfriends who were African American and some of them said I was more white acting or I really was more Indian than I was black and that was kind of the first time I had anybody really question or challenge me when really I didn't think it mattered because I knew who I was. Um, I don't have any children right now but I do have nieces and nephews and you know we always share with them family songs so that they can sing them and hopefully one day dance to them and my sisters always make it a point to bring them back home to Nia Bay to participate in the cultural dance practices and when our family has when we have a potlatch or something, make sure we go home and participate in that as much as we can, even though we live so many miles away from the reservation. But one big thing is, um, you know, growing up in the city, their teachers don't know that they're Indian. They don't know that when they, they probably hear them talk about Nia Bay all the time, they just don't really know who they are, so they don't really stand up and celebrate their native side because they pretty much, um, identify as Native and the teachers think of them as African American. I'm Katia Brown. I'm 10 years old and I'm in fourth grade. My name is Trello and I'm seven turning eight this year and I am in second grade. Hi, my name's Freddie and I'm six years old and I'm turning seven and um and my birthday is on July 13th. So what tribe do you belong to? Nia Bay. Macaw. Nia Bay. Macaw. Nia Bay. Nia Bay. Do people think that you're, what do they think you are in school? Some people call me Mexican. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Freddie? What do they I call you? I nothing. What really about you, Tia? Black. What do you tell them? I say I'm, I say I'm not all black. I'm Native American, Irish, and black. So get it right, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thing that I've always tried to teach you know my students that nobody can take away from you who you are or what you're all about people can say mean things to you they can try to belittle you or degrade you or talk about what you're wearing or they can talk about what you look like but they can't take away who you are your identity in terms of knowing that like knowing I'm a Macaw and knowing that my father's African-American and I'm proud of that or knowing my grandfather's Irish and knowing my grandmother was Indian and she was a proud Indian woman who overcame so much just for the sake of our family. So um, that's huge. I think it's often sad that somebody like me who is triracial has to consistently prove not only to the native people I'm native and I do care about my culture but to the african-american people I'm very upfront I'm willing to learn about it I mean I only know what my father and grandparents have given me you know but I'm never gonna be more black than Indian and I don't try to be respond to things or if you're a strong person 
where does that come from? And, and looking now into my history, it's like, okay, I come from a very strong background. You know, African Americans have always been strong people, and so are Native Americans. So I can't help acting it sometimes the way that I do. <laughs> There's so many similarities just in history, I guess. Even though the experience is different, the, the feeling of what came out of that is, I'm certain, very, you know, similar. Well, in my own mind, if you are of Indian blood, I mean, you're Indian, that's pretty much it. If you're of blood, you're of blood. I'm very, you know, embarrassingly, I'm very Eurocentric in a lot of my, my habits and so on. But that ethnically doesn't change what I am. My father's a Yoruba. In the Pacific community, he comes from, in South Carolina, called the Geechee or Gullah people. The other side of his family is Kitawa. And as far as my mother goes, her grandfather was an old colonel slave in the railroad here in the 1800s. And when they weren't, you know, necessary anymore, when they were setting up the reservation system in Oklahoma, he was dragged in with a lot of other Filipinos and they were just marked as native. In his case, he was thrown in with the Cherokee, otherwise known in all languages, the Kituwa people, and um, married my great-grandmother and that was that. When I was in kindergarten, they had a color chart on the wall with, you know, the basic stuff, you know, red, green, blah, blah, blah. And um, we had to write a page on, you know, who we were. So I had to write my name and, you know, what country I lived in, such and such, and what I was. So I said that I was an orange person because I was going on the list, the color list that was above the, um, the closet. And the teacher called me up to the desk and it's like, you can't say that you're orange. There's no such thing as an orange person. And I'm like, oh, yeah, there is. They're brown people. And I pointed to other children in the class and I said, they're whites. And there was one, you know. And I said, you know, there's other, you know, tan. And I pointed to a couple of, you know, Puerto Rican, you know, girls that were in the class and stuff. And I'm like, that's me. I'm orange. Because as far as I was concerned, you know, I looked orange, right? So that was the closest thing. You know, and even though, you know, I was a child and, it was kind of laughed off as, you know, by some people anyway, that it was, you know, it's a little innocent thing, you know, isn't that cute? Other people were very, very upset by it. My mother was not happy by it. Her thing was, you're black. We live in a black neighborhood. You know, your father's black. You're black. That's it. And, you know, maybe two or three days later, on a Friday, if I remember correctly, I was brought into the principal's office and I had to talk to a psychologist that was trying to do this woman who was to convince me that I was a black person, that there was no such thing as orange. And I told her that my father might be black, but you know, my mother is Indian and, you know, my grandma is Indian. And, you know, we always talk about it in the house, being Indian. And it's like, you know, some of us are orange, you know. And it's like, well, why do I have to say that I'm this and I'm that? And I'm like, I'm not a black person. I'm not like that and I pointed to something in the office and we were in there for a few hours you know and it came to that they couldn't convince me so I actually had to go and see a professional because I had a problem my circumstances were such that you know I had gotten so much you know trouble for trying to be open about being you know native African and so on that it got to the point where I couldn't really fight it anymore. So around my first year of high school, I met my first white kids. I went to a vacational high school and I became a super Uncle Tom. I tried to be as white as possible. Even went to the point of spraying my hair blonde for a while. <laughs> All that bullshit. You know, and you got white guys laughing at me like crazy, but I was trying, trying, you know, like, like hell. And that lasted until I was about 26. I had some people in my apartment and while we're drinking wine and cheese and trying to be bourgeois, they flat out got tipsy and told me how they really felt about me. Like, you know, you're, you're an exceptional you know, person of color, but you know, you're still 
of color. You're not really on a level, you know, la la la. And that's when I realized all that ass kissing I did didn't do a damn thing, you know. So I did a number 360 and I'm pretty much right back where the hell I started from as far as that goes. Because if you can't accept me for what I am, you know, I think I'm a hell of a nice person and I have a lot to, you know, to give. So it's like if you don't want to deal with that because of your confusion over what I am, which is leading to my confusion, you know, then I really don't need you around. It's, it's hard to describe the feeling, but it was like once I saw the names, I'm like, oh, there's you know, it's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, mama was right. <laughs> so it's really cool just to have, you know, everything kind of, you know, come together. It's kind of like putting a quilt together, you know? It's only a quilt, so it's pretty cool. Oh, gosh, this is my great grandfather. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was married to Loretta. And that his daughter, Juanita, and a son, Robert, and a stepdaughter, Vanilla. And I'm going to print it. My Cherokee heritage is not listed on there. And I think back then, things. People wanted things to be as simple as possible, so you were either black or not. So it didn't matter if you had native heritage. I think I will find my Cherokee heritage. Now that I actually have more information, I can ask more questions, better questions, to get more details, I think. I had a lot of support and concern about my Native American heritage from my grandmother. My mother and father was very uh, casual about it. They didn't press it. But my grandmother was very uh, conscious of this and making aware that I was aware of it. The town I lived in, which is called Lamityville, was part Shinnecock and, uh, and Afro-American the whole town at that time. And the uh, family next door would practice their Native American culture continuously and I was not, even though my grandmother uh, talked about it a lot, and I said, oh those Indians next door, she slapped me hard and picked me up and hugged me. I can still feel the slap, but I also enjoy the hug and to remind me of the fact that I was Native American and never be involved with a prejudice statement. You know, right? I started painting as uh, very early. It was very instinctive. Then I went to Europe. At the same time, there was discovery about my Native American and American heritage, because I was on the outside looking in at my culture in Europe. And so when I returned, that's when I became more dedicated and involved with the the uh, creative process and with the dual culture is what I, I'm really concerned about, which is very similar in many ways in the United States. Even though uh, the, her the African heritage is part from Africa, but the Native American heritage is the land here. And how much the Afro-Americans go back to 500 years being here, right? And how much that becomes the heritage of Afro-Americans in, 
in this land. And so in the dual culture of them become Afro-American, Native American, is very unbelievable, very sensitive, very spiritual. I did a, a lecture at, at the Smithsonian, and I was expressing the fact I'm Afro-American, Native American. And I asked, the, since half of the audience was Afro-American, and I asked how many uh, uh, in the audience are part Native American. Almost all the blacks in the audience raised their hand. And then after they put their hands down, there's a man stood up in the back and says, the only reason I didn't put up my hand because I don't know, which has to do with many. They just have no idea and know anything about that. So, so I was surprised that all these Afro-Americans in the audience raised their hand. How much do they know about that dual culture? So at the end, when with, with the talk was over and I met a lot of people, I asked some of them, they said, well, I know my grandmother said this, my father and grandfather said that, and my mother said this, and they know the fact that it was part of Native American culture there, and some of them mentioned, even mentioned the tribes. And they said, oh, why? But, but they don't live by that, where I live by this dual culture. And it's really part of my painting. recent years I realized what the various influences are in terms of color and patterns of design and composition. It was related to some of those early exposures as a youngster to Native American quilting and, and designing and painting and, uh, and how much in Afro-American culture quite involved with a very similar kind of sensibility. So when they both come together, I guess that is my world and that's my identity. It's all subconscious now, and it just comes out at the end of the brush. You know, I, it just, it didn't seem real that I was actually graduating. This was the main mark in my life. My trip, I will be headed to Louisiana, which is where my mother's family is from, and my um, grandmother's the the Cherokee blood that I've been researching and and do some interviews there. I you know I can accept both parts. I have an understanding of a better understanding of Native community and and yet I still have so much to learn too. So you know so I'm open you know that for anything to happen now. And I think a lot of it has to do with me finishing school. That it's just like I'm done now. I can do more things and I can find out and spend more time. You know so. I'm excited. I'm really excited.